Good morning. Okay, I have a few minutes, five minutes. My name is Anthony Merelles. Anthony Merelles for English speakers. Dear audience, sincerely, I hope you will survive my English. At this moment in front of you, I represent nurses as a profession. A large part of the health staff in many countries, usually working in the shadows. Maybe some or many of you are wondering what the hell a nurse is doing here in the ICUH. Uh, me too. We are women, we are mothers, we are fighters and we are survivors. We bring care. When I was younger, last 80s, declaration of Almata was a creed for many of us. Almata, a city in Kazakhstan, then a satellite country of the USSR, hosted the International Conference on Primary Healthcare in 1978. Declaration argued that governments have a responsibility for the health of their people, which can be fulfilled only by the provision of adequate health and social measures. Primary health care is the key to attaining all peoples of the world a level of health that will permit them to lead a socially and economically productive life. It is the first level of contact of individuals, the family and community with the national health system building, bringing health care as close as possible to where people live and work. As close as possible to where people live and work and constitutes the first element of continuing health care process. As a nurse, you must allow me to tell you that urban health will never be achieved as long as you don't fight to have or maintain a national health system in your country. If economic, economically developed country or developing country, doesn't matter. It is not a simple ideological and political issue, it's a fact. World of a nursing public health. A few years later, in 1986, Ottawa Charter for health promotion was born in a warm of an international conference. The charter taught us what the fundamental conditions and resources were necessary for getting healthy. Take notes, please. Peace, shelter, education, food, income, a stable economic system, sustainable resources, social justice and equity. Yeah, 1986. As a women, mothers, fighters, survivors, and care or care providers. Uh, sorry. As a women, mothers, fighters, survivors, and care providers, we believe in class struggle, not only between workers and employers, but mainly a class conflict among plutocrats, the group ruling or, hosting or using power or influence on account of its health. As a result of their conflicts, we watch in astonishment arms traffic and war, human trafficking and slavery, violence against women, looting at raw materials and energy resources, waste traffic, spread of pollutions and plastics, desertification, extreme biodiversity loss, global warming. Oof. Stop, stop. The economy and politics sow the storms. Health professionals reap the consequences as infectious and non-infectious disease in epidemic or pandemic forums. 
As important as providing a cure for disease is preventing their appearance and promote health through sectoral policies. Health for urban needs requires peace, shelter, education, food, income, stable economic systems, sustainable resources, social justice, and equity. Remember the proverb forever. When in world, do as the nurses do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I, I'm Ana Diaz Rue. I'm the uh, director of the Drexel Urban Health Collaborative in Philadelphia, and I have the honor of serving as the PI of the Salud Val Study, Salud Urban in America Latina. Uh, and I will be moderating today's session. I think it's particularly appropriate. This our session today is making it happen, <laughs> where the rubber hits the road. That we heard some opening comments from the dean of a school of nursing because nurses certainly make it happen a lot. <laughs> I remember as uh, the, during the short time that I was a practicing physician, more than once a nurse coming up to me and saying. Doctorcita, ¿no le parece que debería chequear esto del paciente tal? <laughs> Reminding me of what I was supposed to do, and they were always right. <laughs> so um, so um, today's session, we have a, a, a great set of speakers who will be bringing um, diverse perspectives to this challenge that we have in, in public health, in population health in general, in urban health of really creating change, making it happen, using what we know to make things better. Um, and uh, we have representatives from academia, from nonprofits, foundations, uh, citizen science, who will be talking about different ways in which they are grappling with this, with this important challenge. So we have five speakers that are each going to speak for no more than 10 minutes, giving some opening comments, and then we will have some time for conversation between the speakers and also comments, of course, and questions from the audience. So I'm going to introduce them all briefly now, and then they'll they'll come up and, and do their, their presentations. Our first speaker is Mark Newhouse, who is Director of Urban Planning, Environment and Health Initiative and, and the Air Pollution and Environment Research Program at IS Global in Barcelona. And he'll be talking about providing evidence for policymakers, the Urban Burden of Disease Project. Um, then we have Carmen Borrell, uh, who is a director of, uh, of the Public Health Agency of Barcelona, who will be speaking about for, uh, her, the title of her presentation is From Research to Health Inequality Policies in Barcelona. Um, uh, then we have Louise Francis, who is Managing Director of Mapping for Change, and she'll be speaking on A Tale of Two Cities, Citizen Science for Environmental Policy. Uh, and uh, next will be Susanna Hossman, uh, Chief Program Officer of the Fondacion Botnar, from, and she'll be talking about from grant making to from grant maker to change maker, Fondacion Botnar's Healthy Cities for Adolescents program. And last but not least, we have Ethan Kent, who is Executive Director of Placemaking, um, and her and his uh, his title is is entitled uh, Building Campaigns for Urban Health Through Placemaking. So, without further ado, I'll invite uh, Mark, who is our first speaker. Um, thanks so much and great to be here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me and thank you. Thank you for coming here. I mean, that I know the bed was so comfortable this morning and it was still dark outside. And uh, I think you're making a big effort to be here. That, uh, And we're all taking note. I mean, Carolyn is particularly, she's taking note who is here because you get a special presence. Uh, she told me that uh, I, I noticed that in the afternoon, the plenaries are completely full and in the morning, not so much. So, but it's all noted eh, that... Uh, and I'm trying to negotiate free registration for you for next year. That because uh, I know your commitment makes the difference, makes it happen in that way. That anyway, thanks so much. Uh, I would like to present our um, project around the urban burden of disease, and I, I, I think I don't have to tell you 
um, that there is a relationship between how you design a city, um, how much you invest in certain aspects in the city, and how that determines how people get around the city, uh, what that leads to environmental exposures and to uh, morbidity and, and premature mortality. So what we see in many cities, there's a, a lot of space for cars. So we get a lot of cities that are car dominated. Uh, people use the car, leads to air pollution, noise, uh, heat island effects, uh, stress, uh, less social contacts, and also less physical activity, what leads to uh, morbidity and premature mortality. On the other side, you know, if you make a nice city for, say, walking or cycling, if you put in cycling paths, you get more people to cycle. And uh, that also leads to less air pollution, less noise, takes up less space, we can use for a better way, more social contact, more physical activity, and also less morbidity and um, premature mortality. Then. We did um, not so long ago a, a health impact assessment in Barcelona, and uh, we found that um, almost 3,000 premature deaths in Barcelona occurred because of what I call suboptimal urban and transport planning. Uh, this may become a bit of a surprise to you because we always say Barcelona is so wonderful. I'm sure Karma will talk about that as well. But we know we have some problems, and partly is because it's so um traffic dominated i mean we have one of the highest traffic densities in europe per square kilometer uh what is a big problem and this leads to to premature deaths Mo a large number comes from the lack of physical activity but also because of the high air pollution and noise levels uh because of the the extreme temperatures high temperatures what we get what leads to mortality and also because of the lack of green space now we when we published this um we got very positive comments also from the policy makers in the city and they said from our oh, publish more because we want to make changes we want to introduce more the super blocks or you know put in more parks and we need to have these numbers because you know this focuses people's minds you can say from ah air pollution levels are high but people say oh yeah it's air pollution or noise levels are high but people say, oh, but you get used to noise. But actually putting it into kind of health numbers, I mean, actually helps. I mean, and so some of these numbers end up also in the policy documents and um, they come up, uh, you know, becomes a target trying to reduce them. That Now, unfortunately, when you look at this, many cities or most cities in Europe actually don't have these numbers. Uh, they don't have an idea how many people die prematurely because of air pollution, or, or et cetera. And uh, so what we set out to do is try to see if we can come up with estimates for many cities in Europe. And fortunately, a few years ago, a few databases became available and that we could um, put together. And at once we came up you know, with numbers uh, about premature death. At the moment, it's premature death. We don't have numbers about uh, morbidity, but it's the next step. Uh, but so we're, our aim is with the projects trying to come up with estimates for, for as many cities as possible in Europe um, uh, to provide for policymakers, you know, some, some targets what they can work on and also hoping to do this in the future so they can monitor uh, the process, uh, progress. So it's not going forward. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so we managed to get uh, data uh, for a thousand cities and we conducted uh, a health impact assess assessment on the cities on different environmental exposures. The focus was on environmental exposure that we could get data for. So in this way, next slide. For the thousand cities, what we found out was that uh, we could prevent up to 160,000, uh, 66,000 deaths per year in the cities if we would follow the new uh, WHO air quality guidelines. And this is uh, five micrograms per meter cube for, for PM2.5 and, and 10 micrograms per meter cube for NO2. Next one, please. Um, so also what we did, we made a ranking 
uh, for the cities. I mean, for the, all the thousand cities, we made a ranking. And also, you know, what we showed was that depending on which pollutant you look, I mean, if you look at PM2.5, what has many different sources, you get a different ranking compared to, say, if you look at NO2, what comes mainly from traffic. So for traffic, we see Madrid very high, very high traffic density. But for PM2.5, we see cities in northern Italy uh, and Poland, etc., where industry is a much more important source. When we look at green space, uh, we could see that we could prevent up to 43,000 deaths because of the lack of green space. Most, many cities, there's not enough green uh, space for green space, or the green space is not where people actually are. Uh, we found that 60% of the people um, didn't have enough access to green space. That's working again. Thank you. When we make the ranking, uh, we focused on European cities. I mean, we see that Brussels in particular, I mean, it's the city with the highest uh, impact uh, of, of the lack of, of green space uh, for, for uh, mortality. Noise, a lot of people don't worry about noise. They say, ah, you get used to it. But we know that uh, with our, we estimated there are 60 million people that are annoyed uh, by noise in the uh, in these particular cities because of the uh, the high levels of noise that's often experienced. And perhaps it's not surprising if I tell you that uh, kind of Rome, 60% uh, of, of people were uh, are exposed to noise levels that leads to high annoyance, so very high. But you can see also other cities like in Berlin, I mean, it's much quieter, we got a, a smaller percentage of people actually being um, annoyed by noise. That. Now, if you live in Europe, and you're interested to see what is your city doing, you can go to our ranking uh, website, isglobalranking.org, where you can key in your city, and then you can get the numbers for this. You can get the levels of the environmental exposures and the, uh, uh, the, the mortality impacts. Um, and so this is accessible to everyone. I mean, also to policymakers that actually can, can do this. Now, quickly, uh, because we're in Valencia, I thought I'd give you a, a, an example rule. Yesterday already gave an example in the plenary, you used the same slides. What we can see is that, uh, for example, here in Valencia, we still have fairly high air pollution levels, and we could prevent uh, over 400 deaths um, of almost 500 deaths if we if we uh, follow the new WHO guidelines for PM2.5 or uh, almost 400 deaths for NO2. So you can see a fairly large burden of uh, disease here still in Valencia because of um, air pollution. Also, um, there is a wonderful walk you can take with green space, but around the city, but in the city, there is uh, still not enough green space. And we estimated that you could prevent 80 premature deaths each year that would increase the green space, particularly in the in the center of the city. And then also for noise, um, still 16%. Um, the noise is probably not too bad in the city center, but still around it. We could prevent eight, 28 deaths per year if you reduce the noise levels. So you can see there's still a particular burden. There's still some work to be done. I mean, I must say I enjoy uh, Valencia. It's wonderful to walk around in the city center or the green belt what's around it, but uh, still some work to be done. Now, the good news is also for the projects, we've just been awarded funding for the next uh, four years to follow up. So this, what we would like to do is uh, provide numbers for every three years so they can actually monitor to see if there's progress in terms of exposures and also in terms of, um, of mortality burden. This part is, is a project, there are five projects funded under this uh, call for the EU looking at health impact assessment. So hopefully we're going to get a bit more out of this. That. Uh, the work is part of a larger consortium. Some of you are here involved to more or less involved in this. Uh, varies a little bit. Um, uh, hopefully in the next few years, more people get involved. Also, what we're looking for is actually more data. If you have data on cities that we could use, particularly we're interested in social economic status data. It's very difficult to get uh, social economic status data on a, on a high resolution in cities, but we would like to include this in our analysis as well to show if there are differences in, in uh, health impact by social economic status. So if you know of any projects or if there's any data, please provide it to us. Uh, finally, um, the work was mainly unfunded so far and I had a few PhD students working on this and I would like to thank them, especially on the left, uh, Sasha here, the first one, 
uh, at the back, Evelisa, um, also Mata, our GIS technician, next to Evelisa and uh, Tamara here on the right at the front, uh, who've done all the hard work and put the data together and all the analysis. And um, it's only with people like that that actually things are happening. That thank you so much. Good morning. I don't know if the presentation can be shown. Si se pueden poner la presentación, por favor. La tengo, la tengo que poner yo. <laughs> ah, vale. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Uh, I will present three examples of um, research and policies in my city. I work in the Public Health Agency of Barcelona. We do applied research. It's not easy for us to do research because we have many other things to do. But I will try to show three examples. And if it's more than 10 minutes, please, Anna, tell me and I stop. <laughs> In the second. Um, the first example is inequalities in small areas. Um, we have had many projects in the last 20 years. Here I have put uh, these three. We have had the media projects that analyze mortality inequalities in more than 20 Spanish cities. And then we had the Inex Cities project. Uh, in 16 European cities and the EuroHealthy project, Horizon 2020, in nine European cities. And in all these projects, we were able to show inequalities in mortality um, in the different cities. Here you can see at the left deprivation by small areas in the different cities. At the bottom is Barcelona. And at the right side, you, you see for three periods of time, um, mortality analyzed by Bayesian models, just as an example of our papers. And with uh, during these projects also, we published this conceptual framework of health determinants in urban areas. It's more than 10 years ago. Probably we should change today, but uh, this framework still is used in our city to present the health report that we, di we do each year and we present to the politicians of the city. Also with Manuel Franco, he's here, Manuel. <laughs> um, uh, we published this, I think that this is very important to understand how politics is going on. And uh, here we publish different stakeholders and process involved in the health uh, inequalities agenda. And we have policymakers, citizens, researchers, and also the lobbies are here. And, and we think that it's important to understand all these relationships in order to understand why policies are there or not. And after all this uh, research, in, in 2015, the mayor of Barcelona changed. Now we have a mayor that the, the political party is Barcelona and Comú, is a left-wing party. And we have had many plans. Here you have four general plans and four three health plans that are related with health inequalities. And then we had the opportunity um, to be able to show the results of our projects and how these results could be in these plans in order to in order uh, in order to tackle health inequalities. I cannot explain all of them, but but um, they are. Uh, important for us. Okay, second example, housing and health. Um, we had a, a project uh, uh, some years ago, the SOFIE project, that tried to evaluate the impact of structural policies on health inequalities. Um, this project, uh, uh, in this project, there were involved many countries of Europe, and you can see the website of the project. There were also 
many publications, 100 or more. And one of the parts of the work package was related with housing. And you have to take into account that housing was a big problem on that moment in Spain. Um, almost half a million people lost the house because they couldn't pay the mortgage. And we had uh, this movement in Spain that is the Plataforma de Afectados por la Hipoteca, people affected by the mortgage. And this movement had a very powerful, uh, a very powerful uh, strength. And in fact, Ada Colau, or our mayor, at that moment was the person who, who was in front of the platform. And we had the opportunity, Hugo Vasquez is here, we had the opportunity to publish this paper comparing health, uh, in this case is poor mental health and poor perceived health uh, of the people affected by the mortgage and of the general population of Catalonia to compare. And you can see the difference, it's 90% of people who have who had uh, poor mental health of affected by the mortgage, 90.6 for women, 84.4 for men. This is mental health, and it's 15% or 10% in the general population. Then we, we, we saw this big, big problem of health and other because of this fact. And what was important? It, it was important that we collaborate in this report. This report, um, the title was Housing Emergency in Catalonia. This report was made by a lobby uh, institution by the university, and we uh, wrote here the, the health chapter. And well, this report was very important because it was handed out to all parliamentarians of uh, of Catalonia in the in the parliament. They had the report. And I remember this sentence of Carlos Macias, and that moment was the man who was the coordinator of the platform of people affected by the, mortgage, the, by the mortgage. And he told us, this report is so powerful for us. No? Then he, they were very grateful for the opportunity to have this report showing the situation of these people and also the health situation. And then this report was, uh, at that moment, there was a law. Uh, it was uh, the law 2015. And this law tried to tackle emergencies in access to housing and fuel poverty. And this law was approved in 2015. Then the right wing, several years ago, the right wing uh, political party on Spain uh, changed part of this law. But here you can see the two photographs, photographies. At the top is Carlos Macias presenting uh, the initiative that was requested by the population uh, before the law. And at the bottom, you can see people that they are happy because the law was approved in that moment. And the last example is related with inequalities in COVID-19. Um, well, as you know, COVID-19, uh, has had so many publications, but we had the opportunity to have information of COVID-19 by small areas in the city, and we could show inequalities in these small areas. Here you have uh, the paper where we show uh, in 2020, and at the left side you have the deprivation index, and at the right side you have uh, inequalities in incidents, cumulative incidents of uh, COVID-19 for men and women. And these are also Bayesian models because these are very small areas. These are census tracts, and this is not so easy to, to analyze. And then we publish with, oh, Pasquet is here, oh, thank you, uh, this uh, conceptual framework based in our conceptual framework of the Social Commission to Tackle Health Inequalities in Spain, that we had a framework 10 years ago. And we published this um, framework based on all determinants related with COVID-19, the more uh, operation systems, patriarchy, capitalism, anti-colonialism, and then the structural determin determinants and the intermediary determinants. And, and I think that this framework can help also uh, to understand how COVID was spreading in, in our societies. And, and what about all this information? 
Um, we published a paper explaining what has been done, the multi-level policy responses in the city. Here you have some examples um, because I have to say that when the politicians saw the maps showing that COVID-19 was not spread the same in all the neighborhoods, but the poorest neighborhoods had higher rates in that moment at the beginning of the of the pandemic. And then it was that's strange. And, and, and we tried. There were many groups working in the local council, not only health, but all the local council trying to uh, implement programs in these neighborhoods where um, there were social problems and also uh, uh, COVID problems. And here you can see some examples, health hotels and quarantine support, accommodation for vulnerable populations, distribution of meals, home health service, municipal telecare, et cetera. And I think that this is also an example that when we showed uh, our results that politicians or policymakers can put specific interventions in this special uh, topic. And I think that this is the last one. I think I had time. Thank you very much. Oh, the slides coming. Anyway, my name is Louise Francis, and I was, as I was introduced, I'm one of the co-founders of Mapping for Change, which is a social enterprise part owned by University College London. And we actually moved out of the university to set up a, an autonomous organization so that we could actually make things happen um, and not work within the kind of academic time frames, which are moved slightly slower. Um, so my talk here is I'm just going to share with you um, a collaborative citizen science project that we worked on um, in two different cities um, and completely different and just kind of share some of the learnings from that. Now, it's quite fitting that actually this year is the 70 year anniversary of the Great Smog. Um, and, you know, at that period, we knew very little about the kind of negative health impacts that air pollution had on people in cities all over the world. But thankfully, with research, we've come a long way over those 70 years. But the fact is, people are still dying in this day and age. So the impact of air quality and air pollution in our urban cities is still very much a problem. Um, the first example, the first project I want to talk to you about is science in the city um, and that was a collaborative citizen science project to monitor air quality in a, a state within the centre of London called the Barbican Estate and it was motivated by kind of two factors. One is that residents were actually starting to voice their concerns in relation to air quality within the city but there was also motivation by the City of London Corporation, the local authority, to really try to understand what the current levels are and get some appetite in relation to what policies that could be introduced that would be accepted. Um, and obviously they wanted to increase public understanding about air pollution to improve the public health amongst the residents in the city. So just to kind of put that urban context, London is one of the richest, well was before trustonomics came in and everything imploded, um, cities in the world. Um, but actually it has a resident population of around 9,000. So it has a very small resident population. However, with the daily migration that increases to over a million on a day-to-day -day basis. So not only does it take up a small geographical area in terms of let's say looking at London boroughs, it also has very low car ownership, ownership with the residents that live there. Now, Kampala, a completely different city, completely different context. Kampala is the capital city of Uganda. And this city has a population of around three and a half million. But in terms of design and urban planning, it was actually set up to house around 150,000. So as you can see, what with population growth, it's got one of the fastest um, growing populations um, in the world. 
And the diurnal patterns that you see there in terms of the numbers of people coming into the city increases to something in the region of 5.6 million on a daily basis. And that's a city that was supposed to house 150,000. So we set up, again, a very similar project there called Science for My Health. And that was a six month program aimed at increasing public understanding about air pollution and also increasing policymakers own knowledge about air pollution with the limited resources that they have in developing countries, but also to engage people in their kind of active involvement in getting them involved in undertaking scientific research. So they both were coming from very different starting points. You have the City of London, which does undertake monitoring um, as is legally required. Residents had a, a basic understanding and also had access to data. Whereas when you look at Kampala, there was little to no data in relation to air quality monitoring. There was no program set up with regards to, and with regards to kind of collecting data and also no legislation. So what we did was in both locations is sit down with a variety of different stakeholders to look at where we could set up a monitoring network and campaign in both of these locations. So with the residents in the city of London, what we started to do is look at where they had perceived hotspots in relation to pollution, and then using those hotspots to actually set up monitoring. In Kampala, we worked with both the local authority and the environment agency, and also with students and teachers in schools. So what we did is we trained both in how to use what we call passive diffusion tubes, which enables people to monitor nitrogen dioxide. Um, and then based on where they decided they wanted to carry out that monitoring, they set up a monitoring network. And in the city of London, that was over a year. Um, and in Kampala, that was over the course of six months. But alongside setting up the kind of monitoring campaign and to be able to collect that quantitative data, this was also went hand in hand with a kind of educational and awareness raising campaign. So in Kampala, we developed a lesson plan and schools program and taught 30 teachers how to actually provide insights and information in relation to teaching some of the issues around air quality. Um, and in the city of London, we worked with the residents again to generate an awareness campaign and the residents went out and sp spoke to taxi drivers that were idling around and also had stands in and around the area to kind of discuss with the broader residents. So the results from the city of London over the years monitoring and this actually I, I should have started by saying this in the city of London the first project was back in 2013-14 and what you can see here in this histogram is that there are a number of sites that the residents erected where the nitrogen dioxide levels were way above um, the EU legal limits and one in particular which is Beach Street which is a covered road was seeing levels in excess of 90 um, and there was a bus stop in the middle of that. So it was a place where people would stand and wait for buses and they were being exposed on a day-to-day -day basis. So on the back of that, residents really started to generate a deeper understanding about the air quality that they were being exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis in and around their homes. Um, and armed with that kind of information, a lot of them were saying, okay, now I know what routes I should take or won't take as a result of that. Some went as far as saying they've sold their cars and gone green, but also pers persuading other people coming to visit them about different modes of transport. And it also enabled the local authority to get a new granular data set with which they could then use that to actually start to think about how can they address and mitigate against the levels that they were experiencing. So the community came up with a number of ideas that, that, that they put forward and actually got incorporated into the air quality, the strategic air quality um, plan for the, a five year period. And they range from looking at a 20 mile an hour um, speed limits, idling campaigns, um, 
But all of those ideas actually supported the case for a number of different policies, both transport policy and also um, the air quality strategy. And actually it led to the first trial of a zero, zero emission street in Beach Street Tunnel. That was the one where we saw those excessive levels. So fast forward seven years, we repeated the same study. Yes, during the pandemic, but we did it anyway. Um, and just here, you can see that this shows you the comparison of the levels that we saw back in 2013-14 versus the level that we saw in 2001 to 2022. And Beach Street, which is the first plot, you can see has dropped significantly as a result. And a lot of that is in relation to the policies that were introduced. So people were saying, OK, how much is that is influenced by the pandemic? Yes. We can't say it's not because it wasn't business as usual, but just looking at the trend over the last five years, you can see that year on year, the levels of nitrogen dioxide were decreasing. So it's not solely as a result of limited traffic in the city during the pandemic. In Kampala, we were able to create the first kind of network um, and baseline data in relation to nitrogen dioxide levels. So they erected 92 sites, both in and around schools, but also in the broader um, Kampala region. And just in terms of outcomes in Kampala, this new data set is it enabled them to, first of all, have a baseline of data that was not there before, and also to support the development of a more systematic and permanent monitoring network and protocol. And based on that, they've actually also used some of this information to draft their first ever air quality regulations. And in terms of the kids and the schools, there's much more heightened awareness of air pollution and the impacts and thinking about certain mitigation strategies that can actually be um, introduced to reduce their exposure levels. And I mean, just in, in kind of carrying out the program itself is also increased capacity within the local authority and the environment agency, because these are, these are I guess, programs and also data that they just didn't have access to before. So just in summary, yes, we were, it was really quite successful in actually having the active participation of residents who then led into um, development of policies, even during lockdown. So they came up with some really tangible ideas. And also it was data-driven policies that influenced the legislation. Um, and just getting people involved meant that there was more accepting and willingness to actually say, okay, something needs to happen something needs to change. And with the kids, I mean, they were amazing. We had a whole set of younger generation who now actually are much greater aware and also a lot of them wanting to think about going into STEM subjects, which was really great. And I think one point to, to stress on here is actually the fact that the temporal scale of the policy life cycle um, and implementing these changes and measures can sometimes lead to this perceived inaction, but things can happen. Thank you very much. It's actually very nice to continue the talk from just uh, taking up what you just said, you know, the active participation, the residents which are uh, being taken also as active agents. And I think this is what um, we are very much uh, involved in. I'm now uh, switching a little bit the perspective. I'm talking from the perspective of a of a funder of a philanthropy. Uh, next slide, or I can do it myself. And I will talk about from grant maker to change maker. Basically, where we see or how we see health in urban contexts or health in general is that it is created in a context of everyday life. Health is actually where people meet, where people are, where people work, where people live, where people also enjoy leisure, have leisure, where they experience support, where they experience empathy, but also often where they experience discrimination. And this is something where we think that this is where the, uh, the change should take place. 
And it was very good to see or very, very inspiring to also hear uh, Dr. Tedros from the WHO saying that uh, we must recognize that health starts not in hospital and clinics, but in homes, streets, schools, and workplaces. Which brings us very much also to the uh, idea of where do we actually have to see the change and how are we going to interact or act upon uh, change in order to improve health or as we call it, the well-being. And for the Siebotna, from the Siebotna Philanthropic Fund Foundation based in, in Switzerland, but uh, active globally, where we put our focus on is first of all in, in cities, because we believe that cities are a starting point for the health equity, uh, where there can be produced many uh, benefits for the uh, for the for large segments of the of the humanity, but we also see as a very important driver of change that there is, and we just saw it in the uh, in well actually in uh, the uh, presentations before. There is a lot of also value or opportunity in uh, digital solutions in mappings. In, uh, in data driven science, in citizen science. Uh, and this is one of the focuses where also, or where we combine, where we see a lot of uh, the, the, the use, the opportunity, but also the risks of having uh, the use of digital and data driven for an uh, equitable future. And then we see as a third driver for change very strongly. The young people, young people, if you think there are about 1.8 billion of our uh, population are young people up to 24 years. And this is something where we also are very strongly engaged in saying that, where are they? They need to be on the table. They need to be also in the driving seat. They need to be active as active agents, as active participants, as active um, uh, active citizens in order to uh, contribute to improving ur our urban spaces. So these are the three the, uh, activities or the three big um, areas where we are working in uh, cities, data driven and meaningful youth participation. And we have several programs, one of which is the Healthy Cities for Adolescents, which is one of the programs, bigger programs, global programs which was led by the or managed by the ISUH over uh, four years and which is still continuing. So we have been funding the Healthy Cities for uh, Adolescents program and with the overall vision to have healthy, again, really like putting, putting the health into the space, into the context, healthy, livable, sustainable uh, in sec secondary cities where the uh, adolescents are empowered, where we can bring their voice and their actions into the lead in order to contribute as thriving citizens. So Healthy Cities for Adolescents is to change or transform spaces. It's to create healthy cities. So it to make them youth-centered or adolescent-centered for a transformation through collective action and innovation. And there are, of course, a lot of very context specific understanding that we need to have. The knowledge about the health in secondary cities, but then also uh, what is very important or where we put a lot of focus in all our, our cities programs is the multi-sectoral partnerships. So we bridge the public, the private and as in your case, the citizens' voice, in our case, the young, young people's voice. We see them as change agents. We see them as active participants. And then, of course, there is always, it's not only you know, like a local, um, uh, a local action driven, but it's also the policy change in order that there is a sustainability uh, ensured or at least uh, advanced um, to have it at the at the municipal municipal level, but also at the uh, eventually national or even global global in reach global level. So when I talk about the Healthy Cities for Adolescents, this is a program which has been which has which is a global program which has taken place or is still taking place in a 
Colombia, in Ghana, in Senegal, in India and in Vietnam. So it's a, it's a broad, but always with the same, you know, always having the, 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 the ideas, the principles on how are we going to improve or how are, how, how are going, how are the cities going to be, uh, changed, transformed so that the agents, the young people have actually a say and also feel themselves, uh, as taken seriously and having a active role in transforming uh, the cities to make the spaces livable and lovable. And just one example I want to give of all of the uh, five, there are five projects in five in all these uh, different geographies. One of the projects which took place in, uh, in Cali, Colombia, uh, by a local Colombian NGO, Fundación Despacio, which is called Vivo Mi Calle. Uh, and here on the picture, you see a bridge. This bridge is a bridge of colors. This is the outcome of a long process, of a participatory process. Uh, this is the outcome. This is really like the, the visible part of very much of invisible actions which have taken place. And I visited this place actually before it was a colorful bridge uh, three years ago, when there was one barrio, one neighborhood, very dangerous, and another and and the school, and then the bridge, and then a uh, and then the the school. So school children or nobody would actually cross this bridge because it was basically just too dangerous. Uh, the inter the intervention here was together then was actually targeted very much on global road safety, very much on like bicycle, like uh, having young people having the, the making the, the, the routes safe to schools for young people. But the process that was taken here was to actually together with the municipality, with the uh, ministry or the sec uh, secretary of education, with the secretary of, uh, of uh, mobility, with the secretary of health in order to bring together uh, also the citizen in order to uh, bring the, the, the voices of the young people and start also the actions and uh, activities by making this bridge a very nice bridge, very colorful bridge. Of course, it's not just about the bridge and it's not just about the uh, safe spaces in terms of like, ha or having uh, safe routes for the children to go to school. Well, actually what's triggered in this process was very much a lot of unintended, unforeseen benefits. A lot of happiness, a lot of safety, a lot of, uh, you could see, empowerment of the uh, young people's changes or as change maker. They came up with a lot of ideas of how they could actually um, form. Or there was a radio program which was installed. There were musics, there was dancing. So the entire barrio, the entire uh, neighborhood there in this, uh, in this area completely changed. And I could wit witness this uh, going back then about three years later after COVID-19 uh, first, uh, first travel that I could go back to see. And I, I didn't even realize that we were actually walking through this area, which before was very much dominated by uh, drug trafficking, by, uh, by gangs, very dangerous area. So the change, making it happen, the change that is taking place is taking place by the active participant uh, participation of the local residents with a very clear goal, the goal of having nicer routes or better routes or safer nutrition, you know, there would be, or there are actually a lot of uh, indicators that I could put here. But I think the change, the transformation which has happened here is much more the transformation on the, uh, on the social fabric, on the social structures, of what on the social cohesion, what has happened over the uh, time in this uh, in this area. Uh, this has also this made school and was actually also then invited by a neighboring a neighboring uh, uh, city Palmira also to come and invite in order to do the same participatory action research approach in order to change. So if I'm now switching, or if I'm now giving just a quick over, overview of like what it actually means from a donor perspective or from a philanthropic perspective, where we are uh, 
trying to make it happen. Uh, we are working on the systemic strategies, not just individual grants here and there. Uh, we are trying to understand, face into the cities making transformation happen. Uh, it is a, it's a systemic change. It's a systemic change which takes time, which goes through which long per, uh, processes, a lot of uh, ups and downs, of course, as well. Uh, it's not just about numbers of people reached. It's not just about how many uh, children or young people now take a bicycle to school. It's much more about also the transformation in the cities. This means, and this now I'm coming a little bit to the more complex issues for a, for a, for a funder or a foundation, This or, or unusual, I would say. This also means we need to have long-term commitments. Change does not happen in two years, especially if we talk about change at the level of the social structure. This also means that we are flexible in terms of budgets or approaches, because I mentioned it there are unintended consequences, unintended benefits or unintended problems. So you have to be, be able to, uh, to adapt to that. The project has to be able to change and adapt. And of course, this very much goes against the classical lock frame approach, you know, the linear linearity. This is like what we want and if uh, you have to reach and otherwise we are not going to continue funding. So it's a very much a flexible approach of saying, okay, we need to learn. We need to see like what, what, what is it that happens? What is it that works? How do we actually get to, how do we grasp what kind of change is taking place? And that also means that we should not be as a, as a funder, not, should, not risk averse. Of course, many of the things I just get, uh, painted you now the nice picture <laughs> of this program, but of course there are, it's a risky, uh, a risky um, way of also making grants and there are a lot of failures, failures where you can also take uh, learning out of it. Failures where you can say, okay, maybe this didn't work. Why did it not work? So you have always to ask why. It's also not limited in scope. So we, for just the Cardi example, we did not just limit it about like um, how many uh, bicycles, how many children did, uh, did feel safe, how many, whatever. It's very, it's very broad. It's very holistic, looking at the city as a as a context, as a at an ecosystem where you can uh, actually do a lot to make to uh, for the change. And I think the most important is possibly this very process oriented. Of course, the nice bridge is one very is an output. It's an outcome. It's nice. That's the picture that we can show. But how to reach to this bridge? It was not just painting it overnight in a. Uh, in, in uh, um, taking a couple of children and painting it. The process of it, how this took place in order to bring in the com community, the residents, making them also accountable, making them also uh, listening to them uh, is a lot of process orientation, which is, which, is, uh, which is needed and which from a funder perspective, at least what I see, is not often so, uh, so well seen because it's not so easy to actually understand or to grasp to um to see how that could what the changes really are and that brings me to the last point which is the exactly this you know like how are we actually going to understand what is happening how are we doing how are how can we know that things are changing how are we documenting? How are we learning? Because uh, of course, it's not just, uh, we, we have to learn, we have to see, we have to evaluate, we have to measure, uh, but we have to measure and see like, what is it that uh, that changes and also being open to, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, to, to data, which we maybe from, from the beginning did not, did not look at in order to see, oh, here, there are very, that's a social mobilization or a social movement which is happening, which goes far beyond the simple, uh, the simple route or bike lane that we were painting or we were supporting for children. So this is the work where we are just at the moment uh, as, the, as a foundation extremely, and that goes now beyond all, beyond the Healthy Cities for Adolescents, across to all our cities engagement programs with the philosophy of having citizens' engagement, young people's engagement, public and uh, private sector combined, where we already start asking like the evidence, 
we want to, to, to go from evidence to action. But actually, we already start by asking, like, who frames the question asked? Who actually talks about evidence? Then who collects? And we could see another you know, collection on your just about to finish yes. <laughs> uh, the, who is actually the one who collects and owns the data? Who is involved in the interpretation of evidence? And who learns? Who learns from the knowledge and acts on it? So this is the evidence to action which we are currently building up, participatory action research, in order to measure the changes based on the principles, which are the ones that I already uh, uh, mentioned in the beginning. But in order to have in the, in the different domains of, the, of change, uh, starting to really like from the ground again, getting information, getting the, uh, the data from the citizen, from the different stakeholders, according to different uh, domains of change, we have chosen five. One is the empowered youth and communities. One is equitable partnerships. One is effective city systems. One is transformative innovation. And one is the global in learning. And with this, I finish. <laughs> so. Cheers, everyone. Uh, wonderful to get to be part of this conversation, to get to be part of this community. Really extraordinary, the the network, the community that you've all built, the, the case that um, we're very grateful for how you all have defined the challenges uh, in ways that we haven't been able to. Um, what an extraordinary organization. Much credit to, to Carlos and the, the board for building this. Um, you know, thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for for the ACE program is what a wonderful community that they're building um, of, of practitioners of of, of great uh, uh, case studies around the world and the community that are behind those um, and really and thrilled that Giselle's leading this now I can't think of a better person that's been able to synthesize and network many different built environment fields. Um, and you know, obviously, the urban health field is the is the way to really connect and uh, and ground this conversation. Um, and you know, what I'm going to talk about is how we can move use place as a leverage point for action for making it happen, and how we can build campaigns together. How we can use place to bring together and create systemic change, drawing on the many solution sets that we all represent, the skills and disciplines that are that are here. Um, so. People have established, you know, recently now how places can be a predictor for many urban health challenges and outcomes. Um, we also want to put forth that place can be the force through which we drive the solutions, through which we leverage and bring the best out of different causes and disciplines and make sure we're addressing things more systemically. Um, so we have been lucky to work, whether at the very local scale, at the, at the community scale or the global scale with the leaders of of many causes and who are coming to place to see how to more effectively address their goals, leverage their investments and create a more collaborative holistic approach and then develop the systems changes, the, the governance financing development systems that can be scaled and replicated. So, but to pick on one of the uh, the limiting factors of, of, uh, of place, um, looking at transportation but you know but in effect the, the problem with place and what we found is the limiting factor with good places is that there's no one in charge of it no one's focusing on that we're all focused on a narrow solution set or a narrow problem set and uh traffic engineers are an example have been they've been solving for a narrow uh you know problem with moving traffic with a narrow narrow solution and so if you you know if you plan for cars and traffic you get more cars and traffic uh, and we created a system where we drive around more and more, we accomplish less and less. Uh, this is New Jersey. Unfortunately, many aspects of, of U.S. built environment practices are being replicated in very detrimental ways. One of the roles we often have is just simply to help people prevent making those similar mistakes. Um, but even at the center of New York, uh, you know, we were defined by cars and traffic and car culture through advertising and in other senses. Um, and we led a campaign in the city that led to a public plaza program. Um, and got uh, Jeanette Sadakan to become the commissioner of transportation, but led with temporary changes, with micro challenges, with working with communities at the grassroots to develop the models, the open streets, the public plazas that, that have been scaled there and scaled around the world. Um, this week, there's a placemaking week going in Nairobi. They've had 
uh, several of these over over the years. Um, one led to a temporary transformation of street that led to a more permanent redesign of a street that was formerly just always traffic that barely moved. Um, so we shape our public spaces thereafter. Our public spaces shape us. We don't realize the extent to which public spaces shape how we feel about ourselves, how we how our own health, how we shape ourselves physically, uh, how it shapes how we connect with others and or don't. Um, but we shouldn't need all of our friends to cross the street. This is a street in Sydney. My father took this picture 25 years ago or more. Um, and luckily, they've actually just pedestrianized this, this street now. So you don't have to grab your friends to cross it. Um, so we want to, not only do we have to realize how much public spaces shape us and in our health in many ways, but we need to realize how we shape them. And we need to more, be more conscious and we're intentional about empowering and challenging everyone to be co-creators of their built environment. We simply can't deliver the change that's needed through the top-down systems that we currently have. We need to develop systems that support and challenge everyone to be placemakers, to be co-creators. Um, so what is placemaking? It is a part of it, it's a fuzzy term that we the part of the, the important part of the process is debating what it is and who does it, how it's done. Um, and there's strengths and weaknesses to it all over the world, but it's a collaborative process by which we can shape our public realm to maximize shared value. Uh, and there was an MIT study that actually found that the biggest benefit of placemaking wasn't the improved place, but the improved social capital and capacity that's built through the process of placemaking. So again, it's building capacity, it's building leadership on every scale um, through a focus on place and through bridging differences. Uh, it's much more comfortable to bridge dif differences, whether it's political divides, economic equity, um, through focusing on our shared goals and shared places, realizing our common humanity and needs for those spaces. And then through that, um, changing places that change patterns, that change culture, not just individual relationships or individual crises. So the placemaking movement has, the, has roots in the work of Jane Jacobs and William White. Uh, my father actually founded an organization called Project for Public Spaces in 1975 to put into practice their work and develop the tools and in and, and, and cases to, to get that work to go viral. We started calling that work placemaking in the mid 90s um, and uh, started looking at how it could become a movement. Uh, so that a decade later, uh, in 2013, we started focusing on this more networked approach to, to placemaking, um, launching, making a case um, with UN Habitat to make public spaces a, a global cause to help start the public space program here that's represented uh, and to get um, public spaces as SDG 11.7 and uh, get 10 principles into the, the uh, new urban agenda around public space and placemaking. Um, and then we, our goal was to get the movement to start to self-organize into regional local networks by 2018. And we had some success. We actually ran a conference in Wuhan the year before the pandemic started, trying to launch a placemaking network in China with, with UN Habitat and ISOCARP. Um, and then seeing this, this self-organizing, we launched Placemaking X to really highlight and connect these regional networks that are really leading the movement globally. We have we have Ramon Moretes, who leads Placemaking Europe here. He just ran a, he ran a Placemaking Week in Valencia, where he's from. He's leading a waterfront tour tomorrow afternoon. He used to run the waterfront here. I recommend people go on that uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, but uh, we just ran a conference in, in Ponte Vedra a few weeks ago, gathering 450 people from 41 countries for Placemaking Europe. Uh, next month, we go to Placemaking Week India. Um, we have Placemaking US represented here um, and Placemaking Mexico represented here by Guillermo Bernal um, as well. So, but the key to placemaking is, is that it's not just that everyone has the right to be in a great place, but more importantly, everyone has the right to contribute to making the place where they already live great. Similar idea to Majora Carter's idea that we shouldn't have to move out of our neighborhood to live in a better one. Um, so we need to empower and challenge everyone to be a placemaker. Um, we are, we've been focused on these regional networks around the world, um, launched by various placemaking weeks. Um, you know, India is coming up, but every part of the world has contributed to this conversation, leading from different strengths and, and sectors um, to define the movement. Um, and we're really excited to connect, further connect the urban health and placemaking movements for, for defining the problem better, more holistically understanding it, um, and building these collective campaigns to bring together and leverage other resources and causes for, for addressing it, for making it happen. Um, so some of the regional networks that have emerged um, in, in recent years, um, you know, they all have websites and resources and toolkits. I encourage you to follow some of them on social media and so forth. Um, 
and some of the some of the recent ones that are Western Balkans emerged. Um, UN Habitat helped start a public space and placemaking network for Africa uh, that was launched recently in Nairobi and at the World Urban Forum. Uh, new ones in Bangladesh and Nepal and Costa Rica and, and others. Um, and each network is leading campaigns in a city or, or nationally, always looking for systemic change, making sure we're not perpetuating the status quo, because you can do that if you're just doing short term improvements to public spaces. Um, making sure we're collectively sharing the stories. We're not just sharing the stories of one implementer, one mayor, one one architect. It's it's the ecosystem of change makers that are, we need to understand to be able to replicate these in a sustainable way. And we need to accelerate impact. We and that's we do that through these networks, through networking, through global organizations, local leaders, um, and using place as a as a as a focus to make sure we're uh, having impacts that shift culture and shift capacity. So we have this idea called the power of 10, which can be a framework for scaling impact and building these campaigns. Anyone can improve the place in front of their home. A great place needs at least 10 reasons to be in it, ideally layered and addressing the needs of a range of different user groups. That's where the magic happens. That's where the connection happens, the creativity. Uh, each destination needs at least 10 places within it. Each city needs at least great, 10 great public destinations. Valencia has created some new ones in the center that are really wonderful and some new ones are, are happening soon. That's how you redefine how a city is perceived locally and globally, how you absorb tourism to, and make sure tourists contribute to the shared culture, the identity defined by locals. Um, and then we've developed these resources. My father now runs something called the Social Life Project, sort of building on what he's learned from public spaces around the world, offering tools and principles to develop placemaking campaigns in cities uh, with case studies um, from around the world. So I encourage you to look at that website as well. So just to close, um, we are really excited with what the placemaking communities and the urban health communities can do together. This is a long-term partnership. We're in it for the long term. Um, let's, let's work together. Let's figure this out. Uh, look forward to connecting with you guys during this conference further. Um, and we have to, it's, it, the, this kind of collaboration is what's required for us to realize the potential of what we are all talking about um, and move from understanding the problems to making it happen. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. These were uh, five great presentations, very complimentary. So uh, just to get us started, and uh, we'll have uh, time for questions or comments uh, from the audience. We have some microphones that are going to go around. But to get us started while the audience comes up with some questions, I, I wondered if you could each say a little bit about something you've learned or some some lesson that you've learned uh in your work in making it happen uh like mark for example you know you showed these incredible estimates that you've come up with in terms of numbers of deaths so what have you learned about how effective that can be in really and really creating change i mean have has has it worked or what well, the the feedback so far has been very positive, and I must say it's it's a particular Carolyn you know, who's here is very instrumental for the conference here as well. But she's also instrumental for our work to actually get out and do the translation. So she's one of the people to get out and get the feedback. But you know, we've heard that it's very important to have these numbers. I mean, to work with because there were no numbers before. But of course, it's only uh, one part of the picture. You know, one thing what I notice of all our presentations, if we put everything together, we we probably would be doing very well. I mean, that's what we need to be looking for. I thought, oh, well, this is a component. This is a component. This is an, and we need it all together. We need to have it all done. I mean, there's no one magic pill. So, and I think um, that's what I'm taking away from here as well, from listening to the discussions. Carmen, do you have any... I mean, you're working in a in a public health agency, which puts you in a very unique position. It's amazing all the work that you've done. But what, what do you think? Um, I think just what I said that evidence is one thing. Yeah. But there are other things: politicians, mm -hmm. ideology, lobbies, citizens. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all this is influencing politics mm -hmm. and policy making. Therefore, I think evidence is very important, but it's not enough. Yeah. There have to be other aspects. And how do you, because, I mean, you've provided evidence, but you've also, things have happened is there, if I, under, as a result of the evidence or other things too. But what do you think was the ingredient that made it 
work? It depends on the examples I showed, because, for example, housing, um, there is a very big movement of the population. This platform of people affected by the, mo the mortgage, they have been pushing the agenda in this case. Other cases, we have more, uh, more power. It's not power, but for example, showing inequalities in the city, health inequalities, I think this government has been very uh, sensible. Other governments have not. Yeah. Then for me, ideology also is important because health inequalities is a problem of also of social justice and social justice, not everyone is for social justice. Mm -hmm. Then it depends. Yeah. I think it's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. Depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Louise, do you have any reflections based on your experience, lessons you've learned or? I think it really comes down to the starting point because the starting point in a sense in having these conversations and trying to have you know start these participatory processes it's not an even playing field um the environment the ecosystem is not the same so really if you're wanting to try and make something happen you have to start where people are at and whether that be local administration the policy makers residents communities what is that starting point and then how do you use that to build build on it and develop a vision and collect data that's relevant in the context and in the location um, that can support informing these um, changes but also again building an awareness and capacity um, for people to also feel empowered to push for change okay. But it, yeah, you have to start where people are start at people rather are than at. expecting people to say, okay, you know, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it because it's there's no silver bullet. And it's, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Susanna, do you want to add yes, anything? Just building up from a, from all these uh, just statements, you know, and Mark, what you just said, you know, if we all pr would bring the things together, then actually uh, change would happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our big learning is, uh, you know, we always talk about multi-sectoral, multi bringing multi-stakeholder together, but then you have to be aware of the power relationships, of the, politi of the politics, uh, of the different organizations work culture, uh, like academia does not work the same as a uh, community based or as, as young people or as politicians. There are very different uh, ways of working and bringing them together and doing something together, first of all, needs trust. Second, but needs also to really like long time. Uh, and that's, I think, what we learned that it, it needs a long time. It's not quick fixes. And uh, what goes against it is that many of the projects are actually used for classical grants. So they are actually used, you know, like we have to deliver the, the numbers. Yeah. But if a don donor comes and says, yeah, but we're also, you know, like we are very much interested in the processes, uh, it's also a new learning, even for the um, for the project partners. Ethan? Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate what people have been saying is that I think this community is uniquely positioned to to synthesize the solutions to understand the problem holistically and to develop it um and we need to start where we're at we're also we're connected to these these bright spots around the world these stories these these uh, these sort of nodes of innovation of creativity where we can the most learning can happen the um the you know most creativity the most replicable models can be developed um and then through our networks we can help sort of spread these but yeah we need to we you know we're unique you know coming out of the pandemic we you know we did connect it virtually globally now we're coming back together you know it's these teams of people uh that that are going to solve this and Giselle's no better person to synthesize uh the built environment field that has a broader perspective of it um so wonderful that you know, the leadership of ISUH is is poised to to help connect this further and build this conversation and uh um, but lastly, I'll just say we, it takes, we say it takes a place to create a community and a community to create a place. So the best way to synthesize um, and is actually to focus on, on action and, and meet people where they're at. Um, and, and then the best way to build the community is to working together around a place. So finding opportunities for us all to work together in places and then connect again to the global conversation, I think, is, is perhaps a, a framework we can, we can operationalize. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience or comments?
Uh, hi, speakers. Thank you so much for your time and your work. I'm inspired uh, hearing stories of empowering community, uh, amplifying voice, um, and anchoring place as a solution. Um, I appreciate the conversation about politics, and I would like to ask a little more about political engagement. Um, I'll be candid uh, at times about my own aversion to engage in politics due to device, divisiveness or messiness. Um, but I was wondering if uh, you have any advice about how to, um, you know, push forward research for advocacy, connect across divisions, and um, really embrace the political messiness. Go ahead. Well, partly today is a very important uh, day for politics and air pollution. That it's the announcement of the new air quality guidelines uh, in the EU. And I think that they're going to be very important for health. As I showed you, like our cities, we say we could prevent over 160,000 deaths per year, premature deaths, if we lower the current limits to the WHO. I mean, and, and the number of us, I mean, I just mentioned also here, Audrey is here is the, in the policy committee of the IEC, but other, others have actually been working on this to, to push these numbers. And I think it's extremely important because if you don't make the case, you know, in terms of air pollution, it's uh, the car manufacturers or the whatever, uh, all companies that make their case and nothing changes. So I think it's extremely important to go out there and, and get this message across that the current levels of air pollution have an impact on health and engage with the uh, policymakers on a local level who can make some changes. I mean, we've seen it, I mean, with the placemaking, et cetera but also in particular in Europe on a European level. And that's why we need to talk, talk to the MEPs, to the commissioners to make, to make our case. And that's also what we're trying to do. Any other, does anyone want to jump in or? Um, well, I think that in the case of social inequalities in health, politics is very important, are very important because it's social justice, as I said before. And therefore you have to have this view of social justice. And I think that not all political parties have this view and these interests, because at the end, it's different interest in society. And then for me, politics are very important and we have to be involved in politics in order to try to change things, because if not, that's impossible. But I have conflicts of interest because I, I am directing an organization that is directed by the local council and the local council of Barcelona is is left wing at this moment. Yeah. Therefore, I have to say this. Mm. But for me, this is important to change things. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is my reality. Yeah, I think Ethan wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah. And then Susanna, I'll, yeah. I'll just add that we find that at, at the place scale uh, is where people are often most progressive. And we've worked in some of the most Trump supporting communities in the US, where at the local level on the main street scale, they're just as progressive and compassionate and accepting um, as, as, as anywhere. Uh, once you get to another level, it's another question. But our sort of theory is that connecting people to place in each other opens them up. And again, if we, if we can create successes in a range of different contexts, you know, what, what most goes viral is, these, is, uh, is people having, you know, living in lovable places, thriving, um, and seeing, uh, you know, seeing this, the imagery of people succeeding in these places is what transcends politics on, on many levels. Um, but we also have to think about building leadership. It's not just politics, it's building leadership from everybody. We have our biggest crisis is we're at a, I think, a low point in, in our um, ability for people to create change around the world. And so it's, it's, uh, it's you know, sort of... Um, you know, sort of action that that capacity for action that's needed. So you know, and that's and you know, if the people lead, the leaders follow. So and, you know, we we uh, we need to build political capacity um, to transcend politics at the local level, um, but also to build political capital for leaders to actually um, to follow these you know the best practices. Mm -hmm. Can I just say just yeah, go ahead. One, one word. I think you know the first step is actually to being aware that it is 
political and to understand that there is a political economy behind it and not to depoliticize and make all these nice, you know, with the uh, projects here and there, but actually to really being aware that there is a political agenda always, whatever we do. And then following up on that, having the political leadership and going to the to the level of advocacy as well. Also understanding who is on the table, who is not on the table, why is who uh just just understanding it analyzing it and then acting up and yeah and i think something i mean it's also systemic and that's what's really challenging because a lot of the things that we see are the results of the economic system you know the, the systems that we have in place that exhibit this feature that where it's very hard to change <laughs> because of this sort of policy resistance phenomenon, you do something, but if you don't really address some of the fundamental drivers, it's, it's hard to create sustainable change. Um, so you have to come at it from various angles. A any other uh, comments or questions? We have we're almost at time, we're at time, but I think. Thank you for your interesting and lovely presentations. <laughs> in the national coordination to promote cycling in the Spanish cities, Khaled Kombithi, we're doing a similar but modest experience like making uh, mapping for change. Cycling with Clean Air is a citizen science project uh, where volunteers from 14 cities are measuring while cy cycling. Our central objective is to raise public awareness, but um, also to influence the political agenda for the proper implementation of low emission zone. So like coordinator and volunteer too of the project, when I'm cycling and measuring near the traffic jam and always a lot of cars parked, I constantly wonder um, what strategies are being carried out with with success um, by the institutions to reduce the number of cars in cities. So any reflections on clearly transportation, another systemic factor that derives a lot of what we see. Any any quick responses to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly. I, I mean, I think that how cars have taken over our cities is probably the biggest crisis um, or, in, or the, the biggest limiting factor for public spaces and you know a huge contributing factor to many of our public health crises. Um, and I, we also think it's the it's the opportunity the biggest opportunity for for transformation. Um, we don't think being against cars is often the best strategy. I mean it, it, I, I am and we should be, but uh, we think that creating places where people want to be has had more success. So, you know, we need you know, the full spectrum of advocates and, and the ecosystem of advocates supporting this. Um, but what worked in New York was actually developing the vision for these plazas and these open streets and showing that people were, um, you know, happy, creating great imagery and videos and then getting the data. A good report just came out yesterday from the Department of Transportation that showed the incredible economic impacts of the open restaurants and open streets program in New York to help make the case to sustain it because it is under threat right now. Um, but yeah, let's, that's, that's the biggest opportunity. We say, if you plan for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic, you plan for people and places, you get people in places. We need to leverage all the different resources and partners to reinvent our, our street space as public space, as public destinations. I think Carmen and then Mark, and then we'll, we'll close up. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I, I have two comments. I think that to reduce cars, it's important to have a very good public transport. For example, in our city, public transport inside the city is very good, but to go inside outside is not so good. And there are half a million cars each day in Barcelona coming in and coming out. And this is a problem, but if they don't have a good public transport, it's very difficult for them to change. This one thing to, to say, public transport important in order to reduce cars. And the other thing is that we have made many sessions with citizens trying to understand climate change and, and, and cars. And I think that everybody understands very well that cars are not good and climate change is going on, but everybody wants a car. Yeah. Everybody wants a car. And we have seen this in, the, in our meeting with citizens in order to explain our plan of climate change. 
And I think that's, that's very difficult because politicians are in the middle of the people, as I said, and in the middle of the health and, and the situation. And therefore, to, to deal with all this is not so easy. It seems very easy. We don't want cars, but it's not so easy. And I think it's because of that, that the situation is so difficult. Yeah, I, I think following up from that, I think the car is still a status symbol, particularly here in Spain. I mean, you need to get rid of that kind of idea, I think. And of course, having a car doesn't mean you have to drive it. Uh, actually, the reality is that most cars are parked, whatever, 96% of the time, taking up space that you could use in a better way. Although in Barcelona, they're parked on the ground to a large extent. That, But coming back to your question about cycling, from our research, we've seen that to get people to cycle, you need to have safe cycling infrastructure um, that they feel safe, that can go out. And unfortunately, many cities don't have that yet. Uh, we're fortunately in Barcelona, we're getting more. Uh, the cycling infrastructure is increasing in, uh, rapidly, but still, you know, you can get stuck at once between cars because the cycling lane stops. And so we need to improve that. But also what we see in other cities, and I'm coming from, from the Netherlands, you know, it's all about cycling. You need to have, to have this safe cycling infrastructure to get people to feel safe, to start cycling but of course that's not enough and there are many other measures soft measures to make it much more pleasant to cycle um, so it's also a whole program and often like the netherlands is taken as an example from oh so many people cycle but you know it's taken about 40 50 years to get there and i think again i mean it's a long time view you need to take uh, and making sure that you create a space for what you want to have in the future not what you have at the moment so i think on that note clearly we could talk go on talking about this for hours, but I think clearly um, the lessons are that we, as Mark was saying, we all these approaches need to come together because it's systemic, it's political, it's about attitudes, it's about local, local actions that people can take right in their own block. Mm -hmm. So to be continued, thank you so much to our, to our speakers okay. today.